Hi, everybody. My name is Jared Milrad. I'm the founder of Movie Karma. We created our podcast here called Rewriting Hollywood to focus on issues of inclusion, equity, representation, as well as social impact through the power of storytelling. We've been fortunate to have some incredibly talented Oscar eligible and now Oscar shortlisted short filmmakers uh, on the on the program here. And today we have another one uh, which I'm really excited about. Uh, his name is Martin Strange Hansen. Uh, his film uh, is now Oscar shortlisted for the 2022 Academy Awards in live action short films. It's called On My Mind. Um, it's a really powerful uh, film that touches on family and love and um, life and death and everything in between. I'm um, really excited to talk to Martin today about his film as well as about his journey into the industry and some of his other uh, uh, projects he's worked on. So Martin, thanks so much for joining us. Excited to have you on the show. Well, hi, Jared. Thanks, thanks for having me by. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Thanks for joining us from uh, from, from Copenhagen, Denmark today. Uh, so so let's let's start off here. Uh, we we saw you have a, a pretty robust and, and, and storied background um, in the industry, but before um, before we get to that, uh, we were curious about your journey into the film industry. We saw that you uh, obviously you're a Danish film director, screenwriter. You made your debut as a director in 2001, I believe, with the movie Feeding Desire. Um, and then wrote and directed a short film um, called This Charming Man. What was that journey like to get started into the industry? And, and did you always know that you wanted to be a filmmaker? Well, yeah, because it kind of started before those two films, of course. Uh, Feeding Desire is my graduation film from film school. So there's been some years before that. Um, well, I think most of them have, have a that are interested in film has one moment where we kind of like oh my god this is amazing uh and for me that moment was i lived in the countryside and there was this uh once every month there was this uh, film club uh in the uh, gymnastics uh hall somewhere uh is, is it called that gymnastics yeah well you know yeah, where sure. people do gymnastics the gym. they put out yeah. and chairs and a projector, right? Yeah, sure. Uh, I must have been, yeah, sure, something like that. And, and I think I must have been around eight, nine. I went to one of these and um, the projectionist put on uh, the old Robin Hood from 1937 with Errol wow. Flynn. <laughs> yeah. uh, and that was the kind of films they were showing to us at that point. And I remember, I think my mom had said to me before I went, Remember, if it's scary, it's just a movie. It's not real, it's just a movie. And I remember si sitting there and we were, I mean, of course we were all excited, there was wash sparkling, there was arrows. And then at one point there was this guy who was riding on a horse and I remember suddenly I saw an arrow flying and hitting him in the chest and then he fell off the, the, uh, and the, off the uh, horse. And I was like, that's amazing because it's not real. How did they do that? So for <laughs> me, that was, I, was, I mean, I just immediately got, there was someone doing an illusion, a magic trick for me there. And that's really, that's, I mean, I would love to do that as well. So of course I started, you know, tried to make some animation and write a, a Western film myself, like those that I've been seeing a lot at that time and then, after school, I tried to apply to film school, and that, of course, takes some years and practice. So that's my foray into my first foray into film. That's really cool, and I love that it was like a kind of a classic, you know, older film that, um, you know, I think sometimes we we don't. I, I, I would argue nowadays because we're so caught up in streaming and just watching, you know, like digesting so much content, we don't we don't sometimes appreciate like the simplicity and as you said, the magic of like story of just like great storytelling and great filmmaking. Um, so did you have early on, like did you have mentors or teachers that encouraged you or guided you? And I'm wondering like what they what they said to you that was impactful to you. Yeah, I would say that um of course, during my, uh, where I came from, there was not really, I mean, nobody wanted to make films there. I got some friends that wanted to, but, but it was not before, I mean, until I kind of, uh, I would say that when I applied for film school and did not get in, actually, uh, 
uh, the director, Lone Schiaffi, uh, who made uh, uh, Italian for Beginners, very good film. Uh, she called me and said, well, you did really, really badly at that uh, interview mm -hmm. there. You directed the actors really, really badly. You, you need to learn something. Maybe you should uh, take some acting lessons to know what it's like to be an actor and have some, uh, some, someone saying directions at you. So in that sense, she became, she mentored me in the, those, that, that early stage of my career. Um, because up till then, it was kind of, you know, trying to baffle my own way around it, finding a film course there, film course there, finding it somewhere where, you could, where I could work as an assistant, assist, ed, editor's assistant, uh, and, and stuff like that. So uh, getting her to saying that, and also another director who, uh, was uh, at that meeting saying, well, you should apply again, uh, kind of really, I mean, you know, your peers, someone saying, uh, you did badly, uh, learn from it, and then try again. That was a very good thing for me. Yeah, that's cool. You had a couple of people who were, who were kind of encouraging you and supporting you. Um, and talk about some of your earliest opportunities that you're able to land, at, you know, as a working filmmaker, or did you, you know, with some of your earliest projects, were you kind of going out and creating them yourself and what we call kind of bootstrapping, you know, finding, finding financing and people to work mm -hmm. with, or what were those early days like for you and what challenges did you face? Well, if you talk about the early days before film school, it was hit and run. I almost was like, okay, so um, I have to make the, I'm trying to make this because I want to rehearse how I'm, I'm doing films without dialogue. I need to try to make something completely without dialogue. Uh, do you, and then I would ask some friends, do you have time to help me this weekend for that? Um, so those were completely unfunded and all that, but I was working a place where I could use the the backdrop they had and they was kind of that was kind of it right and then um going on and coming into film school uh then of course uh, then after film school then it comes suddenly become in the professional way and then you have to uh, apply for and have a script and, and all that and then uh being able to find out being able to i won't say converge but you find out that well to succeed your scripts, to succeed your ideas, you always have to adjust them to find out where, how to reach your audience the best. And the first audience you have is the gatekeeper, right? So you have to find out how to like, get my story and like, my theme across in a way that makes it believable for the gatekeeper and who can see that it's actually a film in the other end. Uh, so yeah, we got out, we got funding for this charming man right after my graduation film, uh, which I had. So I had kind of the story already in, in mind and we got the funding for that. Hmm. And were that was the earliest funding, uh, did you, were you able to use, I, I know Deadly Denmark has some, some, you know, kind of countrywide funding and film funds and other, there's other resources. Yeah. Was that, was that instrumental to you? And part two of that question is, you know, do you think that type of funding is a good way to help early filmmakers get started? Because, like, I, you know, I would, I would argue that's something we really desperately need in the United States. We don't really have something like that here. Right. Exactly. Exactly. This specific uh, funding uh, opportunity we had was something that was targeted at short films and short films by young and emerging and new filmmakers. So in that sense, it really did spark uh, and help me get my career going by that, the basic idea that it was also one thing that was not just funding, it was fully funded from, uh, yes, you could say the government hmm. uh, by, by the Danish Film Institute by that point. So that meant that uh, we didn't have to do, use a lot of time after the funding came through to find extra funding and co-producing and all that, we could concentrate on getting the, the film done. Yeah, that's a, that's a, you know, I think a good example of the type of public support uh, 
federal, state, local support as I'd like to see here. Um, your your latest film, uh, before we get to, to On My Mind, uh, I saw in 2008, you were behind Denmark's first webisode, an animation, uh, animation series uh, called Pinglian Light, which I understand um, was based on real embarrassing experiences uh, from over 300 young people all across Denmark. It won recognition uh, from the Webby Awards in 2009. So we were just curious what that what that was like for you to be part of such a milestone and how that, you know, how that came about, what the impact of the series was. Well, the funny thing was that it was, um, again, actually it was uh, one of the Danish broadcasters that were thinking, well, uh, young kids use a lot of time on, on their phones. Uh, and what they see is people hitting each other in the face. Uh, that was the, that was the level of YouTube at that point, <laughs> falling or hitting each other. Right, so uh, maybe if that's their primary screen now, we should try to develop some stuff that actually has some kind of quality content. Uh, so they made this call about uh, could it make something for the small screen, and 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 for me it was I mean if, like like if we rewind all the way back to my story from about. Uh, or Robin Hood and Errol Flynn and I was like okay there's magic here for me it was like uh, going back and finding out because I'd never done animation before and I had to talk talk to a screen that was I mean it was before we had smartphones like this it was a tiny 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 screen and I had to kind of find out no I, I know how to make stories I know know how to tell stories but how do I do that in a completely new medium with a screen that is basically non-existent and make it um, both engaging and evoke emotions. So for me, that was kind of a, I always have loved the idea of uh, trying out stuff and being somewhere where I don't know if I'm actually can succeed, yeah. Yeah, it's both sort of terrifying and, and probably really exciting too. Um, yeah, it's really cool. Uh, well, let's talk a little bit about your your latest short on my mind. Uh, it's now Oscar shortlisted, as I said at the top. It's about a, a man named Heinrich who wants to sing a song for his wife. It has to be today. It has to be now. We don't know at the first part of the film why it has to be now, um, but it really raises issues, of course, of life and death. And I, and I understand it was a, a personal, uh, based on a personal story for you. Can, you. can you tell us a little bit about the genesis, uh, Martin, of the story and, and how it came to be? Yeah, uh, you can say that there are two ways into this story. One of them is that, uh, one of them is that if you say, if, let's start on the light side first. The light side is I, Actually, at the after the uh, rap party on um, this charming man, I went. We went to this skate bar which had a karaoke, <laughs> and I was drunk and I was happy. And someone uh, in the crew said, "Martin, don't you want to sing a song?" I was, "Oh yeah, of course I want to sing a song." And I went up to the karaoke and I loved it. <laughs> I loved it so much. I loved it so much that I kind of missed the point of karaoke. That is, you sing a song and you go down again. I stayed, and I stayed for I think three hours. Oh my gosh! Wow. Three I've hours. been the worst karaoke party oh. crasher you could ever imagine. Um, uh, but I had a terrific time, which I don't think the other people in the uh, cinema did, or the uh, the the bar did. Um, but um, it made me wonder at one point about, well, what if there was this guy who wants to sing this song and it's the same song and he keeps singing it. And then why does he want to do that? And then we dive in energy because um, why he wants to do that is because he wants to say something to one who is very, very, very close to him. And in 2001, I uh, lost my, my daughter, mm. uh, whom had been, I mean, who had a fatal disease. Uh, we knew that uh, very early on in her, in her life. 
And uh, at one point we were going in and out of hospitals and all that. So it's, uh, so at one point um, we were in the hospital. We were kind of actually thinking that we were waiting to say goodbye to her. And I haven't, I hadn't slept for a week, a month at that point. And I, then there was kind of, we thought with the, actually maybe there's kind of hope and we can maybe uh but i i need to be awake tomorrow i need to sleep until tomorrow because uh there might be hope tomorrow um because of what's happening in in, in her story but and then it was like but i can't sleep i'm too sight what do i need oh i need a whiskey mm -hmm. so i went out of the hospital I went into the nearest dive bar and it was exactly like in the film, only two people in the dive bar. And I went up to the counter and said, I need a double whiskey. Didn't talk to anyone and I was drinking it, drinking it and, and then I left. But I remember sitting there and seeing it from outside and feeling this is like a Western movie. A stranger walks into a bar. Hmm. And while I'm sitting here and I'm in this really, really, really deep uh, sorrow-ish waiting, right? Where, I mean, those moments right now, those moments the next, tomorrow might be defining for the rest of my life. While I'm sitting there, the two guys who are the only guys in the bar next to me are sitting and they're having this surreal conversation about, so I'm um, talking, what would happen if you took a rope and you tied it all the way around the globe and you tied it really tightly and then see the other one said, well, yeah, then I have a rope around the globe. Yes, but then you take one meter more and put that on the rope. <laughs> How much slip will that rope have all around the globe? And it was like, and it was like, this is so surreal. So that kind of that feeling kind of stuck in me, being in a very, very, very dark mode, but also that there was this surreal feeling of people being somewhere else where, where nothing matters. Uh, so that kind of stuck in me. And those two are kind of the main. Uh, inspirations for my 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 short film. Mm, yeah, it's, it's, it's really. I as you can see, it's also about. I mean, dealing with uh, saying goodbye. Yeah, dealing with saying goodbye to someone we love, and uh, obviously, gr you know, grief and uh, you know, uh, trauma and tragedy. I mean, there's so many elements to it. Uh, as you were talking, I, mean, I, I think about my own experiences and maybe listeners will as well, there, you know, our own experiences with grief or loss or folks we've loved, you know, you know my kids, a, a parent, my father, who like, they're, they're sort of the surreal moments, as you said, in a way, like, I feel like when we are dealing with trauma and we are dealing with loss, or maybe this just happens to filmmakers, but I don't think so, but where we, or creative people, where we maybe leave, we leave our body in a way and we kind of see it from a different perspective kind of as you were describing, it can feel almost surreal. Um, so what was that process as you started to take those two, those different experiences and, you know, make this story, this, this short story? And was it difficult for you just on a personal level to, to do this because it was based on such, you know, such personal loss? Mm. Well, one thing, I mean, started with the last question first, mm -hmm. No, I don't think it was difficult because it was based on the personal loss. Uh, one thing is that it's, uh, I mean, she died five days after 9-11. That was a wild year. Um, and so as you can hear, it's, it's taking a while. It's some years back, uh, but there's so much about both our lives with her and also her sickness, and she was say her death, that uh, has moments of joy for me. I mean, my wife and I, we're still together and we talk about her and we cherish that she was in our life. 
I mean, and because of that, then going back and opening up something that, yeah, it's very personal, it's a very, it's a deep wound, of course, but it's also a basic human part of existence. Yeah. And losing mm -hmm. someone. And I, I mean, you know, you always say, write what you know. And uh, I always choose something that relates or is in a way connected to emotions or something that I've been through, because if I can do that, then I can make the audience relate as well. Uh, yeah. So, um, yeah. So that's why. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, that's, I think just a great uh, service in a way that you've, that you've done this to others, because I think, it, obviously the more personal the more specific we get kind of ironically right people can see themselves in it even more um and uh, so i wonder like what what has been the impact of the film have uh, i it's not, obviously it's screened in, uh, in different parts of the world and uh, i'm wondering what folks have said to you have they come to you and sort of share their own personal losses or hey this this really connects me because i have experienced something like this what has what the response been yeah, one of the things that um yeah, I went to a screening and I always the moment I have a possibility to go, go to a screening, I do. Uh, because I mean again, I think it's important as a filmmaker to do that because you have to experience your film with an audience. Uh, because then your film becomes physical. You can physically feel your film and the beats in it and when it's not working. And when it is working. And I must say to my happiness that there are some elements here that I can feel now here they are I mean here they are one they're connected with what's happening in the film right yeah uh, but of course it's a film that makes people come out afterwards and a lot of people have done that come and said well real you know it reminds me of when my father died or last year my my child was sick or when and then after actually several people have said this is about the corona right this is about how a lot of people have been not been able to say goodbye because we have been disconnected in that way and then it's like you want to do that and you can say yes it is it's my story was not about that but a lot of a lot of people around the world right now know that exact feeling and uh, yeah maybe would have liked to have the opportunity to to say goodbye and have that last connection that's so true and yes yeah, so that that's that's art right where people people kind of apply it they take they take it in any direction and it, and in the current environment there's a lot of uh trauma just from not being able to say goodbye as you say and a lot of loss of life um so, you know, having gone through this process of this film, it's now a, a, an exciting note. It's Oscar shortlisted. What do you feel like are the types of projects you want to do next? Um, and, and are you drawn towards, you know, more socially impactful or socially resonant projects? Like, uh, you know, I would argue this, this is for sure. Mm. Well, um, well, yeah. I'm working on, I have a couple of uh, projects, of course. I'm also working as a screenwriter. We're working on a, a um, writing on a film about a big, big trauma uh, in, in a, this fishing village where a, uh, what do you call that? A rescue boat that was come new built and could not sink the first time it was out, it sunk. Oh. and everyone on board died and it was a small community so it's like nine people from this community died and then they were blamed themselves oh, wow. Wow. by i won't say the government but by uh the authorities that had made this boat come true mm -hmm. right wow. uh so there's then we're working on a that angle about what happens when you're in that situation and you're again it's in a way it's a story about how to deal with trauma and and loss uh, and what do you do how do you react to try to i mean the, the main character he tries to uh 
persuade everybody that it's not his father's fault and his mother she kind of closes down and i mean so so that's uh, one project and then i have this other project which i think uh this is a tv series which is a based again based on a true story by an old man that i know who oh i can't tell the premise it's so good <laughs> but uh, but but let's just say it reflects it takes it's takes place in second world war oh. and it's six children that walks uh during the last winter uh walk alone carrying a baby uh all the way to the borders of denmark from Ger from berlin wow. and uh and i mean he's one of the surviving uh, kids there and what I want with that story is that I find it really, really interesting because some years ago, we had, I mean, we still have the war in Syria, and the, but, but so we had these, uh, the, immigra the immigration from Syria suddenly came to Europe and we were not really responsive or like, no, no, we don't want them here. But it's, I mean, the same thing happened yeah like in the second world war just beneath us and our neighbors right so i i always find that i mean stories even though it's second world war has to say something about our present right like this one yeah absolutely that nativism streaks of of kind of you know don't not not in my backyard kind of uh mm -hmm. yeah so that's fascinating those are some, some fascinating projects and definitely some socially relevant themes for sure which we we i know uh, our organization our podcast really like to see and support um the last question that i had for you uh martin are just what we call a rapid fire question so these are just sort of quicker um lighter questions and the first one is very relevant to your film uh on my mind uh which is if you have a go-to karaoke song uh that you that you like to to sing <laughs> go to karaoke song is delilah Delilah. Ah, oh, nice. Okay, that's yeah. good. Really good. Um, what do you do if this happens to you? If you if you if you ever get a block, a creative block when you're trying to write or direct, um, are there any rituals you do creatively to kind of get your get your kind of juices flowing and get in the zone, so to speak? Oh wow. It's always, I mean, every block is a new block, but I have this thing called uh, walk and write, where I put my because we can do that now we have i mean this is my workstation and this computer here is my entire my entire office i don't need a room to do that right so uh, at one point i had this uh, ritual where i was like okay i my son was going to kindergarten and then i said okay so now i today i'll work i'll walk into kindergarten uh, or to school and then i'll just walk for 45 minutes with my computer on the back, where I am in 45 minutes, I will stop and I will go in somewhere. I will not ask for the Wi-Fi code, but then I will write for three hours and I will get up and I will walk for 45 minutes, go in somewhere and write for three hours. And in that sense, because, or if I'm stuck, I will walk out, I will go and I will walk. And in that sense, I mean, it's, and it, you really get a lot of work done because your your body, emotion, going that, just walking there, you kind of um, chew on on the process of what you're working on, and because you're not really thinking about it, you get ideas and like suddenly come out of your blog, and then I also do well. It's okay to go into, oh, there's a museum. I can go in there. It's still on my walking time. I can do that. Hmm. Yeah. That's so fascinating. So I'm going to try that. I don't know. How, it might not be as effective in LA because I feel like you could walk into like a freeway or, you know, maybe it could be the final walkable area here. It can be a little tricky, but yeah. that's a really, that's a really neat suggestion. It kind of is like, you know, when people say they, they write in their shower, or they think of something in their shower, or they think of something in these kind of, when, they're, when their background brain is, is working. It's really interesting. Yeah. Uh, my last question was just uh, uh, wondering if, if you could go um, to a time when you were younger, going back to when you were growing up, 
Uh, is there something that you would tell yourself at that time, uh, a word of wisdom, advice, uh, and what would that thing, that thing be? Oh my God. Word of wisdom to my younger self. Mm -hmm. Well, success teaches you nothing, uh, but failure does. And one of the things that, I mean, right now we're talking about, we're talking about a film that has like, has a good run, uh, but is really important for me while I know that this is out and it's doing well to kind of still have my feet deeply in the ground saying, well, mm. but that's not why I made it. Mm. I made it to travel the world and connect to people. Mm. Uh, and I still can go back and see arrows and should say failures and whatever that I have to deal with and have to learn from. Yeah. yeah great, great perspective to have, I think too, because like you said, it's, it's, it's one project, it's one, it's one run and uh, awards are nice, but they're not, they're not why we, why we create really at the end of the day, hopefully. <laughs> yeah. No, this was not, this was made in a rush. It was, uh, <laughs> Five, five weeks before shooting, I was like, okay, everything's closed down. We can have a bar for free. I'll write, a, I'll write this <laughs> script. I had the idea already. Uh, write it, and then uh, we can be in that bar. And because it's locked down because of Corona, nobody has anything to do. Let's do it. Yeah, it, the, the timing of it, and just like, get it, let's get it done. But no, it, it turned out, obviously, really, really well. And uh you know, I'm, I'm so glad we could we could talk again. The film is on my mind. Our guest named Martin Strange Hansen. Um, it's it's a it's a film now, Oscar shortlisted. It's a really powerful, personal story, as we said, of trauma, of loss, of family, love. Uh, hope folks will will take a chance to see it. Uh, Martin, thank you again so much for being on the on the show. Really appreciate it. Thanks a lot, Jared.